cold on a Sunday. Your guitar and play me a song. Let the music lift our souls. I love the sound of your voice and your fingers on the string.
Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to Momentum Boost. I'm, of course, your host, Adrian Gold Davis. And those of you who are lucky enough to come on early, I'm not crying. Are you crying? Oh, that song was so beautiful. So we've missed you. But we have an amazing, amazing lineup of special guests this month. And we're going to delve into the theme of human dignity. Now, from a Jewish perspective, Human dignity is understood simply and powerfully. Each and every human being is a composite creature, both a body and a soul. And that soul is holy and it's precious beyond measure. And while we humans focus on our physical selves, our appearances, our, our abilities, our productivity, our fundamental worth cannot be measured in those terms because our worth lies in the fact that we were created in Hebrew, B'Salem Elohim, in the image of the creator. And as such, we are automatically imbued with holiness. Now in Perke Avot, which is in English, the ethics of our fathers, the rabbi Ben Zoma says this, who is dignified? One who gives dignity to all people. Well, Parenting a child with special needs can teach us powerful lessons about empathy and about dignity. Today, we have the remarkable Ellen Schwartz, and she's going to share the lessons she has learned from the extraordinary life of her forever son, Jacob, and how she finds hope and meaning in every new challenge. But before I introduce you to Ellen, I want you to have a look at this brief clip. I think it's going to give you a sense about who she is and about what you're about to learn. Take a look right now. Eyes kind of lit up and oh, there they are. I have a question to ask you. And Jake's fine with these questions, just so you know. Anybody feeling a little bit uncomfortable right now just uneasy you can't describe it just a feeling a little strange if you are just go like that okay. thanks you know what it's very very normal it's okay to feel like that right why do you think that we feel like that sometimes when we're around somebody that's a little different why do we feel like that yeah why it's probably because we've never seen this before you're right when you walked in, you saw a very big boy in a wheelchair, right? And I get it. I get why you felt uncomfortable. Because I used to feel like that too. I used to feel very uncomfortable when I met someone who was very different than me. I think part of the reason is because we're not allowed to ask questions, right? We're not allowed to be with somebody where we can learn more about them. So today, I want to try to let you ask whatever question you're thinking, anything. There's nothing you can say that hasn't been asked to Jacob or myself. Now, I want to ask you something. Does Jacob look sad or happy right now? He is so happy. He loves being with you. Yeah, he loves coming to the classrooms. He loves meeting the kids. So anything you ask, isn't going to hurt his feelings, isn't going to hurt my feelings, okay? So ask, who has a question? Yes? Well, some days it's, it's harder to get him dressed because there, I will be honest, there's some days he wakes up and he's having a lot of trouble with his breathing. Oh. My video is frozen. Well, that was a short technical glitch. I was frozen in time. I hope you haven't left me. Anyway, it's time for everybody to sort of have a sense of, um, 
of who she is. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about her. So Ellen is an elementary school teacher. She's a community leader. She's the author of two incredible books, and she's an extraordinary public speaker. She's the founder of Project Give Back, and she links her decades of teaching together with her personal passion for charitable causes. She co-founded Jacob's Ladder. Jacob's Ladder is the Canadian Foundation for the Control of Neurodegenerative Diseases, and Jacob's Ladder has raised over $3 million towards research, education, awareness, and therapy into neurodegenerative degenerative illnesses. But mostly, she's changed the world with her extraordinary outlook and her beautiful soul. Welcome, Ellen. I'm so glad you're here. Hi, Adrienne. It's so nice to be here. Ah, you know, honestly, I looked at the, I watched the, the obviously the song, which I, I just makes me cry every time, and the short clip of you and Jakey in the school. And I think one of the things that you have is this extraordinary grace. You have this ability to put people at ease. And you emphasize that part of the problem people have with differently able people are people who look extraordinarily different because of their disability or just ethnicity is that we're not allowed to ask questions. Tell me why you think that questions, because typically a parent will go, shh, don't point, don't look, turn away, turn away, right? And, and that's got to be uncomfortable for the adult as well as for the child. So tell me a bit about questions and why that was your way in. I mean, looking back at that video, all, all I see is Jakey's big smile. <laughs> oh my gosh, just to see that is, uh, is, is such a treat. But we would often, you know, we'd, we'd go places, we'd be at Metro or the library or, or downtown or Yorkdale, anywhere we'd go, and people would stop and stare. And because you're right, they'd never seen anyone like Jakey before. And when you reach out to them and say, it's okay, just ask away, it's always the kids who yeah. would say, why do his teeth look funny? And yeah. they'd slay the answer. And they just, the kids actually teach their parents it's okay to smile and to ask questions. Because if you don't ask, you're never going to know. What would you say, and other than the teeth, what do people <laughs> ask? What is it? Is it, is it his visual self may his soul just elevate he's probably there in heaven laughing right now going oh people oh. You know what, I, <laughs> what an extraordinary boy he was oh gosh anyway what what is the most common thing and 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 since we're focusing on dignity right now was this not, wouldn't you think typically that asking somebody, I mean, we have this thing now, right? You don't comment on somebody's body. You don't say anything about what they look like. But how do we learn and grow if we can't ask questions? Well, I think you can ask. And I think it's, it's how you ask the questions. If you're asking in a kind and caring way, when you really just want to understand, who wouldn't want to answer that question? And with Jakey, that was pretty much what always happened. What you didn't see in the video is, you know, eventually the kids started singing to him and you really saw him want to, want to dance. So what happened was, is the children just moved closer and closer and closer. And at the end of the video, I'm like, look where you guys are sitting. And they all look around and they laugh because they just edge closer and closer because they were so comfortable with him. And then at recess, they basically said, see ya, Ellen, we're taking Jakey with us out to recess. Like they made a friend. So at the beginning, they just saw this big boy in a wheelchair. And at the end, they saw the person and they didn't just see the chair with the boy. They saw the person who happens to be in a chair. So yeah. it was like, Tell me something. I know that children in their purity and innocence can be quickly transformed, but how do you deal with the adults? So the beauty with Jacob is he had that, you saw it in the video, he had that smile and it just, it would draw anyone in. He also loved music so much so that he just 
would light up when a song was sung or somebody sang to him. And he was so dynamic without one word spoken, but just people, people were just drawn to his innocence and his beauty that just came through. I think that we feel, I mean, I think we know intellectually, we know metaphysically that we are not, we're, we're bodies, but we're actually souls that are being transported in a body. And somehow Jacob's joyousness, really you could feel his soul in a way that, you know, I, I just wonder, um, what did you learn from him? What did he teach you about self-consciousness, about human dignity, about what it is to be a soul first? What did you learn? Oh my, I, I wrote two books on him. <laughs> yeah. Three hours. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I, what about your understanding of how to ensure dignity in other people? What did raising him, having the privilege of raising him, you know, excuse me, I have something in my eye, I got to pull on my eye. That's okay. Um, what did I, that I give learned you? there's more to a story than, than what we see. Huh. You know, we're, we're so quick to judge, but if we take the time to understand another person and where they're coming from, um, our whole perspective can change. Uh -huh. And he, he taught me that. He also taught me to, to slow down. What's the rush? You know, when you were with Jakey, you, you couldn't, you know, we're all so busy. Our lives are so overwhelmed with this, that, that, that. when you're with Jakey, you just, you slowed right down. You, breathe this in the slow way he was able to breathe he was it was like meditation being with him and he taught you that he just said nothing else matters but the here and the now so he was teaching us dignity and of course I mean you saw the way he was dressed we always made sure that Jakey Sean, you know, like his hair, he had this great hair, and um, we made sure he was dressed to the nines, and he just always looked great, and um, <laughs> his, his dignity was so important to us. His fingernails were always clean, his running shoes were always spotless, his, he, it was really important that uh, he always smelled delicious. Yes, I remember. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, so he, life with him was all about dignity. So help me understand, there have to be certain hacks, there have to be certain techniques that you, we can learn from you about how to afford that dignity, how to ask questions properly, how to find it in ourselves. What are some of those dignity hacks? Can you share that with us? Yeah, so when I spoke to you before the show, you asked me that question. And I actually reached out to some of my buddies who have children with disabilities. And it was so interesting. We all, in our own different ways, said the exact same thing. What are the hacks? We, they were the same for all of us, which was kind of cool. So one was, instead of staring, smile and ask questions. We all felt that instead, you know, our, our, you know, our reaction is, I mean, I'd be walking in Metro and a mother would grab her child and go the other way, you know, rather than say, Hey, you know, what's your name or what's your son's name or right. So that was one, just smile and say, hello, it's simple. The other thing is to speak to the person um, age appropriately. So if there's a, a child in a wheelchair and, and he or she or they happen to be eight years old, speak to them like they're eight years old. If they're 30, talk to them like they're 30. Um, they really appreciate that. We can't assume that their intelligence level isn't the same as someone else that age and often they're um, emotional intelligence level is higher than anyone else because, as you know, they're on such a spiritual level, on a high spiritual level. Um, another thing is 
to try if it works to be it to speak to them at eye level you know rather than looking down to them to be right where their eyes are so you're you're speaking with them and not to them and that's really important um and then the other one was to speak to the the child and the caregiver not just the caregiver and not just the child to be inclusive We'll learn more. So those were the kind of the hacks that we all we all felt were really important um, little tidbits of information to know and understand. Those four are very important, and I think that I think this speaks to not. I think I think that people are so afraid to cause pain, to mm -hmm. cause hurt, that they would rather kind of run down the other aisle then take that risk. So sharing this kind of information is a community service, not just for the person whose dignity you're trying to maintain, but also for the person who, who is moving through the world with that fear of causing any form of offense. Yes. It's interesting, you mentioned this high spiritual level. We were talking before the show that there was a time where rabbis, you know, there was a rabbi who used to stand up when a very profoundly differently abled person came in the room, the assumption was that the soul of that, that particular person was so elevated that the only thing that was necessary was for that soul to come into the world. They had nothing to improve upon except to teach other people how to give. So they were I free. <laughs> I, uh, I saw that for 21 years. Um, I agree. Like, you know, Jakey wasn't able to, to see or to speak or to move, but he moved and touched everybody who was empathetic enough to learn, to learn his language. And his language was the language of love. And um, so I totally agree with that. We were, we were talking before, we were just at a, a funeral the other day of a friend, a family friend, whose daughter had passed away and she had significant needs as well. Mm -hmm. And the priest, it was a Catholic service and the priest took holy water and blessed the coffin, but said her name because he said, she was as close to God as we will ever get. And I just thought, wow, wow. In every, in every religion, we all, we all feel that purity that soul is just so pure and here to teach us lessons. So Ellen, when I first met you, Jakey was very small, being schlepped around in a, in a wagon while you delivered the challahs you baked for everyone. <laughs> you were a very young mother. I don't think that Ben was even born yet, right? I, I don't yeah. think. No. And I remember you speaking, and this is going to go back 15 years. So I don't know if you remember it, but you don't have to know it off by heart. But you told a very famous story by, I believe her name was Emily King Pearlsley or Pearl Kingsley called yes. Welcome to Holland. Mm -hmm. And that was a story to me that discussed the dignity of every situation through every place. Do you remember it? <laughs> Do I remember? I know it off my heart. <laughs> here, here it now, because whenever, Ellen, yeah. that day, whenever I find myself faced with a situation that was not what I expected or wanted and didn't know what to do with, I say to myself, because of you, welcome to Holland. Right, she was a writer for Sesame Street and oh. she had introduced, her daughter had special needs and she introduced disability to the world, you know, through that lens of Sesame Street. And her, she was asked to make a comparison of what it's like to have a child with disabilities and her whole um, analogy was um, getting on a plane and your whole life you've dreamed of going to Italy, but all of a sudden you've landed in Holland and you have to learn a whole new language. And it's just the journey of getting to Holland and learning to love Holland. And mourning the fact that you didn't get to Italy, but as she says, you'll never be free to enjoy the very special, very lovely things about Holland. So that's the story. And that was anonymously put in my mailbox box when Jacob was diagnosed. I still don't know who put it there. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now you've written two extraordinary books. Uh, 
Lessons from Jacob, the first book. I remember reading it in one Shabbat. I did not get off the sofa. I sat there with my box of tissues, but I had the privilege of, you know, meeting your son more than once and feeling his energy. I was even there at his bar mitzvah. <laughs> this to me was a beautiful example of dignity with different abilities. You know, there are people who think that having a bar mitzvah means that you read from the Torah on a particular Saturday. But in fact, when you become 13 as a young man or 12 as a young woman, you get an additional component of your soul and you're now obligated to a higher level ethical, moral mitzvahs. And you don't have to, I mean, you don't have to do anything, really. You become a bar mitzvah. You don't have a bar mitzvah. But I will never forget your son up on the bima, beaming on the bima was what I was thinking the whole time. <laughs> he did. As, as you marked that moment, and it was a reminder to everyone else, you know, we do, Momentum does a men's trip. And uh, I heard a story about a guy who was given a bar mitzvah on top of Masada because he was dyslexic and he was told at 13, you can't have a bar mitzvah. You're not a bar mitzvah because you can't read properly, which of course was erroneous. It's not true at all. So in some ways, when I think about dignity, I think about creating environments that work for everybody. So if you have someone in your life who has a child or, or, or a spouse or they themselves have many needs that you don't understand and you don't know how to help, nobody feels dignified when everybody tiptoes around them like it's scary. Mm -hmm. What are some ways to approach how could I have come up to you? What would I have said? How can I help Ellen? Is there anything I can do? Because those empty words, they're, you know, what's the best way to afford the parent dignity as well? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, so I think, and it's always, people always mean well in their questions. Nobody ever is in, intending to offend. Unless you say, um, take no offense, but you know, <laughs> but uh, nobody is no right. But probably, in my experience, probably the worst question you can ask somebody in need is, um, what can I do to help? Because most people, I'm not speaking for everyone, I, I guess I'll speak for myself, and um, they're very proud. They don't want to ask for help. So, what usually is the answer is nothing, right? Um, so what I learned very, very early on that if I really want to help someone um, and I may not necessarily know how to help them, I just do. I just do. I drop off a meal at their house. I text, can I take your kids somewhere? Oh I drop off a book. Um, if they're going through something, a book similar to their situation, whatever it is, whatever you can do. And it may not even be the right thing, but it's telling them, I care about you. Mm -hmm. I'm here to support you. I'm going to help you. And then at that point, maybe they will reach out or maybe they will say, you know what? It would be great if you walk my dog or what, whatever it is. So that's kind of my, I like that. My go to. So, so the trick is to do something. And if it's not the right something, you'll do something else until you yeah. get it right. It's okay if it's not. It's you the intention. Yeah. People feel that, you know, you said earlier when we were speaking, you said that Jacob taught you to slow down. Hmm. But it occurred to me, I know that especially in, in, in his teen years, his breathing was problematic and that you often would have to um, clear his airways for him. Section, yes. Section, right. And you had to do that every morning too, right? We had to do that at um, the last, I would say, 10 years. We had to do it all the time, very often. So I guess what I'm wondering is, you literally lived in the moment, but literally every breath yeah. was in yeah. the moment. 
And yes. so many of us, Ellen, believe that we have this endless spooling out of time. We haven't got a clue what the next moment will bring. But I think about you and Jacob, and I think this is what it means to truly be present when every breath you take has to be measured. You know, it's, it's interesting, Adrian, because after Jake's passing, um, you know, grief, <laughs> that's a whole other topic, a whole other show, but um, the times to me that are the hardest were the times that um, we had to give him his meds, we had to change his diaper, we had to, you know, and Jake was a person of routine. So, you know, 8 a.m., 12 noon, 4 p.m., 8 p.m., 10 p.m., sometime in the middle of the night, where we were very busy with his, with catering to his every need. And even today, at, during those times, I get a jolt to the heart, like an absolute jolt. So part of me loves that jolt because it's like, hi, Jakey, <laughs> you know, that, uh, because I feel like, oh, thank goodness you're with me. But the other, the other part of it is I learned to take that pain of those feelings and substitute them with, with things that feel good. So to me, it's Jakey time. And it's time in your day to do exactly that, to slow down. At 8 a.m., I have my coffee. At noon, I sit and I have lunch. I don't eat lunch by my desk. I go and I sit and I have lunch. At four, I have popcorn and a Diet Coke. <laughs> and I love it, you know? Um, it's just at 8 p.m., Jeff and I go for a walk with our dog. Like, so you, we've substituted in all those times, they're jakey times. And I feel like it, life just slows down and he's with us. I have another question. I hope this is not inappropriate, but I wonder, were people more uncomfortable talking to you about Jake while he was alive than they... Or were they more uncomfortable when they didn't know what to say after he passed? Now, yeah. now people are more uncomfortable now when feeling. Yeah, yeah, and I just, I just want to talk about him all the time. So this, <laughs> this is the ultimate dignity: is to not erase a person because their body isn't here any longer. You right. still have a relationship with Jacob, with yes. his soul. It's a real relationship, perhaps. Yeah not that dissimilar to what it was when he was physically here in this form. So when we, when a person is grieving the loss, to pretend that there was nothing there out of your discomfort is the ultimate indignity, I think. Yeah. I, and, and, and this is this idea of having an endless relationship with the soul. Because the relationship doesn't end it just changes and that, I'll take away the just just as uh it diminishes it the relationship isn't over it changes that's right right and um he's with me everywhere I go everywhere everything I do you know we we spoke earlier about Jake's soul where it went it just went whoop, right up uh, I want to see him again and um, I'm not as good, <laughs> so I have to try as hard as I can to be the best person. I mean, we just went through the holidays, boom, boom, boom. I was like pounding away because I just want, I want to be there. I want to go where his soul went so we can be reunited again. And that's kind of my mission on this earth right now. Oh, Ellen, this is what it means. May his memory be for a blessing. Thank you. When we think of someone we've lost and we attempt to emulate their goodness and their holiness and to live in the merit of their goodness. Mm -hmm. But I have a feeling at 120 plus three days, because I don't want you going anywhere so fast, 
Easy, go straight down, Ellen. He'll throw a rope for you. <laughs> I have a feeling he'll left you up with his perfectly working arm. Thank but you. I have a feeling, Ellen, that you're not going to need any help going up. Mm, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing your truth, your essence, your vulnerability, and your love so that we might all understand what you learned through raising this boy, what it means to dignify the human being because they're a soul and they are worthy. I love you, Adrian. I love, I love you. you too. <laughs> Thank you so much.